Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hi Martin, we're continuing with Purified Seven Times. And what an interesting first episode we had last week. Well, let's hope this one ties it together somewhat. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe <laughs> people are a little bit more confused or so. Hopefully yes. this will bring it all together. I hope so. So let's open with a word of prayer and get into this. Hi, Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us together. Yes, this is for the most important discussions because it has to do with your word. So please enlighten our minds. And like you said, please protect the word and purify it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Martin, purified seven times was our topic. Here's a quote from, from Here to Forever. While Luther was opening a closed Bible to the people of Germany, Tyndall was impelled by the Spirit of God to do the same for England. Wycliffe's Bible had been translated from the Latin text, which contained many errors. Mm. That puts it in a nutshell, right? The cost of manuscript copies was so great that it had a narrow circulation. All it actually did was create a hunger for the word. That's it. And I was just thinking, here she clearly states that the Vulgate is full of errors. Full of errors, yes. So Wycliffe didn't have anything else because the other manuscripts hadn't arrived in, in Europe. Mm. In 1516, for the first time, the New Testament was printed in the original Greek tongue. Many errors of former versions were corrected. And the sense was more clearly rendered. So this clearly shows us that the received text from which they were derived is the one that corrected the errors. That's it. It led many amongst the educated to a better knowledge of truth and gave a new impetus to the work of reform. But the common people were still to a great extent debarred from God's word. Tyndall was to complete the work of Wycliffe in giving the Bible to his countrymen. He translated it into English using these manuscripts, but he didn't have it all. So it wasn't fully purified, but it was a lot better. Yeah. Then the purification seven times took place. And after the Geneva Bible, eventually you had the Bishop's Bible, and then you had the yeah. King James, which was meticulously translated. Just to bring it back, just to make it clear, it did not matter what or who King James was, he just gave the authority Permission. to translate the Bible. Yes, and there are many stories about mm. King James, whether they are true or whether they are not true is immaterial. He did at some stage write a document in which he expounded on the papacy as the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So that is the other side of the story. But it was the reformers that actually did the translation. <laughs> now Martin Luther's story began, of course, with his protest against indulgences. Mm -hmm. And he wrote 95 theses and nailed them to the church door at Wittenberg. And this is where the war began, because you're touching a doctrine of Rome, yeah. namely purgatory, yeah. which is not biblical. And it brought a lot of money. And in. it brought a lot of money. And Martin Luther questioned whether this was right or whether it was not right. Mm. And today, if you go to Wittenberg, here on the church door, his 95 theses are still there to be read. They only dealt with indulgences, not with the other doctrines mm. of Rome at all. And of course, poor Martin Luther had chastised himself and created or performed many penances. When he was a monk. When he was a monk because he couldn't find relief. And when he studied the book of Romans, first, of course, in the Latin manuscripts, but even there he discovered that the papacy couldn't be right in its doctrine of salvation. And he then got hold of these new manuscripts. Mm. And God created the circumstance whereby he could translate it into the German tongue, which wasn't an easy job because no. there were so many dialects. Yeah. 
And he took all the dialects and created basically a unified language, which yeah. is called High German. And that was used from then on. Yes, and Tyndall did the same. With English. So Tyndall really is responsible more than the people say Shakespeare and mm. others for creating the modern English language. And then, of course, he was eventually banned or hid in the Wartburg at Eisenach, which today is the UNESCO World Heritage Center. And there he had the opportunity to translate the Bible into German. And here's a, a quote from the book Romanism and the Reformation by Grattan Guinness, and it says, Luther writes in answer to the Pope, Rome has cut herself off from the universal church. If ye reform not, I and all that worship Christ do account your seat to be possessed and oppressed by Satan himself, to be the damned seat of Antichrist, which we will not be subject to nor incorporate with, but do detest and abhor the same. And there's a little plaque there which says, Gottes Wort und Luthers Schrift ist des Papst und Calvin's Gift. <laughs> which means, Martin, that's God's word and Luther's writing are the Pope's and Calvin's poison. <laughs> so Martin Luther didn't always agree with Calvinism Cal either. <laughs> and there are some interesting uh, posters of that time where you find Martin Luther uh, pulling the hair of the Pope and plucking at the beard of Calvin. So there were some issues there. Now, remember that the Geneva Bible had Calvinistic yes. subscripts? Those were also removed later. In the King James Version. Yes. Yeah. Now, Martin, it's possible to have a true and a false gospel, right? It's a promise, actually. It says in the Word that will, there will be false Christs yes. bringing false gospels. Revelation 14, 6, And I saw an another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred tongue and people. So if we're at the end, the everlasting gospel must be preached again to humanity. It has already been done. Uh, then it means that it, it was sort of lost and had to be uh, re-preached, but you need the right word of God in order to do that. 2 Corinthians 11.4 warned us, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted, you might as well bear with him. So what he's saying, it's possible to preach another Jesus, one that didn't die for you. Mm. It's possible to receive another spirit that says you don't have to repent. Yeah. Because the true spirit will convict you of sin. It's possible to receive another gospel where you are saved by works and not by the righteousness of Christ. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. So Galatians 1 verse 6 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Is it possible to preach salvation by works rather than salvation by the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ? Oh, for sure. And it can happen easily because yes. it says, yeah, he marvels at how soon it happened to them. Yes. Verse 7 says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. It happened in his days. Yeah. So how much more later? So let's just go through that Alexandrian stream. Mm. The left. The oh. one that's on the left and on the right. The one that is the groundwork for papal doctrine. Mm. Well, there was a school in Alexandria. It was an arcane school. You could almost call it an occult school of Gnostics. Yeah. And one of the leading figures there was Oregon. And he lived from 185 to 253 after Christ. Now, Oregon, being a Gnostic, uh, perverted the scriptures. Yeah. And he changed the wording so that Christ would not be as divine as the scriptures 
appointed him out to be. She made him a little bit less. Yes. Mm -hmm. And from early mm -hmm. on, there were altercations where people called him an apostate. And of course, you had the stream that went through Antioch and Syria, the Syrian stream and the Pashita Bible, for example, which was the received text. And here are these manuscripts which have many Gnostic changes. So that is making Christ a created being. Making him less than what he is. Okay. Yes. And from that stream, we jump to 260 to 340 in the time of Constantine, mm -hmm. where the Roman emperor adopted a form of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But his coin had Mitra on the one side and the cross on the other side. And he was associated with Eusebius of Caesarea. Now, Eusebius was a bishop, mm -hmm. and Constantine instructed him to create an ecumenical Bible which would bring the heathen into Christianity. Mm -hmm. So it was a compromised Bible, <laughs> if you like. And uh, to call it an ecumenical Bible is probably correct. Now, Eusebius was a follower of Oregon. Yeah. So he put together a number of manuscripts, and eventually there were about 50 of these manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And two of the remaining ones are probably associated with the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. Now, the next step was Jerome. Hmm. Jerome was a follower of Oregon. Yeah. So he also had these leanings. And he took these manuscripts, probably from Eusebius, and translated the original Greek into Latin. That is the Vulgate mm -hmm. that the papacy declared infallible and made the standard for Roman doctrine. Okay. The Vulgate is the one that says that Mary crushes the head of the serpent. Okay. That, mm -hmm. Yes, and not Christ. And many, many changes that are in line with Catholic theology mm. rather than Protestant theology. Then you had the Ottoman Empire and then the Turks that invaded uh, the West and invaded first, of course, the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And the Greek scholars with their Greek manuscripts of the received text yeah. that came via the Antioch, and uh, Syrian line through to the West via these scholars. And Erasmus of Rotterdam, a Roman Catholic bishop, just took the manuscripts and put them into order. And this was called then the, the received text. He made the copies of the Greek New Testament. Okay. Now, Erasmus never became a Protestant. He was very close to becoming a Protestant. He stayed a Catholic and was even offered to be a cardinal, but he refused. So he was a, he was a bit of a fence sitter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a bit of a fence sitter. But he never, he never wrote the documents. He merely put them together as they came across from yeah. these Greek scholars. And these documents were then used by Martin Luther to translate the New Testament mm -hmm. into German, based on the original Greek. Now, Martin, between the time of Erasmus and the writing of the New Testament into the normal tongue, German, and by Tyndall into English, we fast forward to the time of Tischendorf, who lived from 1815 to 1874. Now, what is interesting is that the Roman Catholics, in order to counter the Bible of the Reformation, yes. the Jesuits came together and they wrote the Douay Bible. Yeah. The, because it was written at Douay. That's why it's called the Douay Bible. And the Douay Bible, of course, is based on the Vaticanus, mm -hmm. and the Alexandrian and Western manuscript. That was to counter uh, the Bible of the Reformation, which was basically the King James by that time, and the 
German Luther Bible and any translation that came out of the Protestant pens. Yeah, of, and out of the, res, of the received text. Out of the received text. Mm. And there was a big war about it, and they tried to convince the world that these manuscripts were not the best. Mm. And the only example they had was this mutilated Vaticanus that didn't have Genesis in it and didn't have Revelation in it. And then in 1844, very fortuitous, mm. Tischendorf, who happened to be a Protestant, found a document in a waste paper basket in St. Catherine's Monastery at Sinai, yeah. the Catholic version of Sinai. And this document was then compared to the Vaticanus and found to be from the same stable, and it was declared to be a 4th century document, a pure rendition of the original biblical text. <laughs> but it had hundreds and hundreds of omissions and uh, mutilations. Yeah, it was it. some places rewritten like 70 times. Over and mm. over again. But the interesting thing is, Martin, that it was found in 1844. Mm just the time of the Great Awakening and the Advent Awakening, 1844. And the interesting thing is that this Protestant dedicated this find to the papacy. And the papacy was, of course, elated because now a second document could be added to the Vaticanus, yeah. both of them mutilated, both of them containing... Uh, apocryphal books of absolute nonsense, but these were the new oceans of purity. Yeah. And Tischendorf then wrote out this uh, document in the Greek, mm -hmm. and this became the version that they claimed was the oldest because it came from the 4th century. If I remember correctly, Tischendorf found it in 1844, but it still wasn't complete or anything and then he went back? He went back a few years later and found the rest as well yeah. and collated it. Now they had two documents. Mm. Then two professors from the Protestant schools of Oxford and Cambridge, mm -hmm. of course, Westcott and Hort, took these documents, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, and put together the Greek text of 18. 81. And this Greek text of 1881 then became the basis of all new translations. Yeah. They are in harmony again with the Vaticanus. Yeah. So we've gone full circle. That's it. We've gotten rid of the errors in the Vaticanus to return to the errors of the Vaticanus. Now, Westcott and Hort were Protestants, but they belonged to secret societies. Mm -hmm. And they were spiritualists. Yeah. They belonged to an organization called the Ghostly Guild, where mm. they spoke to spirits. Yeah. And another member of their illustrious society was Charles Darwin. Mm. So we have the whole package of apostasy together there. They also created and wrote the secret doctrines of an organization called the Apostles. <laughs> Uh, where they wrote the rituals and the secret maneuvers and handshakes and everything that they had that went along with it. And the Westcott and Hort text became the basis of all modern translations. Now, the interesting thing is that there are thousands of words missing mm -hmm. that you find in the received text, for example. In fact, some of the modern versions have up to 60,000 words fewer than the King James, for example. <laughs> Martin, that's like taking your Bible and saying, how many words are missing? Well, if you open your Bible yeah. and you open it in Corinthians. I also want to see how thick it is. And you go to the book of Revelation, that's how much would be missing. Let me just also see how thick. No, oh, no, it's more than this side. <laughs> That's how much is missing, right? Now, the interesting thing is, Martin, they say 
that the originals that the King James were based on were inflated texts. Mm. <laughs> they had too many words and too many repetitions. So they took all of those out. Now what you've done then is you've often taken out the second and the third witness. Yeah. And? And not only that, you've destroyed the chiasms. Yes. For example, if you go to the book of Revelation, where it says, I am the Alpha and mm -hmm. Omega, and then you have more verses, and then it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, sandwiching the yeah. chiasm in between. If you take out the second one saying it's a needless repetition, you destroy the chiasm. Yeah, the emphasis. You also destroy what is called Hebrew parallelism, uh -huh. where an issue is repeated in order for greater clarity. To but in a different state. In a different way. Yeah. And then many of the, the verses are literally are, are removed. Mm -hmm. And Christ becomes less than he is. Exactly. And verses are introduced which introduce the immortality of the soul. Mm -hmm. Verses are introduced which remove repentance so that it fits Catholic doctrine. Yeah. So the Westcott and Hort text written by these occultists and these secret society members, which claimed that Mariology mm. was pristine. In other words, that's a Catholic sentiment. That's why they could rather have just taken the Vulgate and they yes. wouldn't have had to do so much work. And they were Darwinists. <laughs> they negated the first books of the Bible, so they became higher critics. So these individuals, as far as many, many people are concerned, and myself included, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, were Jesuits in disguise. Yeah, and I think Dishendorf... Papal agents at the best and sure. Jesuits at worst. That's it, and I think Tischendorf was the, also part of that. And Tischendorf was part of the same game. Now, Martin, if the Bible says man does not live by bread alone, but by Every word that proceeds out of the well, mouth you just, of the Lord. You just took the words out of my mouth now. <laughs> Would you like 60,000 words to be gone? And Martin, if two verses say the exact opposite, yeah. like Job saying, in my flesh I shall see God, and the new translation saying, in, without. without my flesh I will see God, they can't both be the word of God. No. One of them must be spurious. If the new translation says heavenly beings had sexual relations with humanity and the received text says that those that followed God, the, the children of God, saw that the children of men, the apostate line from Cain, they intermingled. Mm -hmm. So Martin, if you have two lines and the one says, in my flesh I shall see God, the received text, and the other one says, without my flesh I shall see God, then you have a choice because they can't both be right. No. And uh, if the new translations remove the deity of Christ in many, many places and make him the servant rather than the son, then that is pretty problematic. That probably has Gnostic influence attached to it. So all of these issues together together with the fact that they were higher critics, tells me mm. that uh, there is something wrong with it. And they admit in the translations of the new ones that they are busy with an eclectic text. Explain that as well. That means that the text is ever-changing. But God said that his word yeah. stands and that you mustn't add to it and you mustn't subtract to it. So how can it be an ever-changing word? Exactly. There's actually a curse on anybody that does that. Correct. Moreover, the modern versions are what we call dynamic equivalent versions. Mm -hmm. Now, what is a dynamic equivalent? It means that it is ever-changing and that it is like what God said, but it is filtered through the mind of a theologian. In other words, it is an expose of what the theologian thinks God was saying. So it's based on his theology. Yeah. Now, the King James took that even out of the footnotes of the Geneva Bible. Yeah. But here, it's all the way back. 
So it's not what God said. It's not a direct translation. It's what people think that God said. So you get to ridiculous situations where Jesus declares all foods clean. Exactly. When the original text doesn't say that at all. So the Bible contradicts itself. Mm -hmm. So these are all issues that need to be addressed and to be studied. So let's just continue this. I just want to say, if there is a modern translation that says it's a direct translation, you have to look from which manuscripts. Of course, even if it is a direct translation, if it comes from these manuscripts, which come from the Catholic line, then you have to ask yourself, is this the word of God? Yeah, and obviously we've seen it cannot be. It cannot be. So who's, in whose interest is it to change the theology? Which organization mm. has a different theology? Rome has. That's it. It has a different system of salvation. And if it wants to sell its system of salvation, how much better to change the word of God? That's it. If you take it, they wanted to get rid of the word of God. That's why for 1,260 years, you, couldn't, you, sh you weren't allowed to read your Bible. You're right. And then when the King James call, came out, they called it that poisonous asp. Exactly. That they would tread on its head and yeah. destroy it. And so, take it by the tail like one of Moses' sticks <laughs> and get rid of it. That's what the Jesuits said. So the Jesuits have it in mind from the translation of the Douay already to counter the Protestant Bible. Yeah, because like you said, the Douay says that Mary will crush the head and not Correct. Christ. And then also in that 1,260 years, they couldn't get rid of the Bible eventually. They had to infiltrate. They had to infiltrate. So the Jesuits are there to counter the Reformation. So let's just go a little bit into what happened there. Uh, we read in the book, The Great Controversy, throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbed up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people. And the children of Protestant parents were drawn into an observance of popish rites. That's history, Martin. That is a fact. And you don't have to read it in the Great Controversy. You can read it even in the writings of the presidents of the United States of America. True. Those that still were faithful mm -hmm. to Scripture. Here's another source, R. W. Thompson, ex-secretary of the Navy, USA. He writes, as for holy obedience, this virtue must be perfect in every point in execution, in will, in intellect, doing what is enjoined with all celerity, spiritual joy and perseverance, persuading ourselves that everything is just, suppressing every repugnant thought and judgment of one's own, in a certain obedience and let everyone persuade himself that he who lives under obedience should be moved and directed under divine providence by his superior, just as if he were a corpse, perinde axi cadaver eset, which allows itself to be moved and led in any direction. That was the order of the Jesuits. They obeyed the Pope like a corpse. They would have no will of their own, and if the Pope said something was white or their superior said something was white when it was black, then it was white. Finish. Their object was to destroy the scriptures, the Old and the New Testament. And they are quite proud of it, as we saw in our, one of our previous lectures. Here is the church destroying Calvin and Luther and this little mischievous creature here, which they call an angel, mm is tearing apart the scriptures that Martin Luther gave to the world. 
So their aim was to destroy the Protestant Bible. Here is another quote from Letters and Manuscripts. Now, what does Satan propose to do? Mm. He proposes that he is capable of changing this Bible. Now, Martin, this was written in 1910. These parties that fell understand all about heaven. This is talking about demons. And they can bring in the different sentiments from the Bible and they are going to have a revision of it. Hmm. Interesting, written in 1910. You will see that they will make a revisions of the Bible, but every one of us needs to stand intelligently on the word. We cannot afford to be careless, but we must have that simplicity of godliness that is a virtue to us. We must have it. Now this author... Mm -hmm was exposed to some of the early new manuscripts, like the revised version. And she used it sometimes when it was not doctrinal in yes. nature. When it was doctrinal in nature, she always used the King James Version. Yes. But in any sermon, she never deviated from the King James. And the more she wrote and the closer she came to her end of her life, she never used them anymore. That's true. Here's another document from 1906. Do you desire to destroy the covenant between yourselves and your God? A perpetual covenant means just what it says. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. God declares, for in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. This is our evidence. You will see ere long that there will be those who will become weary of hearing repeated the things that they ought to do, but do not desire to do. And they will change the wording of the Bible, <laughs> written in 1906. We know what the Lord says in Revelation about those, those who do that. A perpetual covenant is a perpetual covenant. They will change mm -hmm. the Bible. She was using the King James Bible. Yes. And like you said, for doctrinal purposes, you can search right through the writings. Yes. As, uh, there, in fact, are ver you can search it when there's um, disputes on certain verses, like we've mentioned uh, Genesis 6 verse 12, where the modern translations um, say that the heavenly beings came. If you do go through the writings of the spirit of prophecy, it's clearly stating that that was the line of Cain and not heavenly beings. Yes, and not only that, Martin, if a verse is missing mm. in the new translations, which is many times the case, sometimes she wrote whole paragraphs yes. or chapters on the missing verses. True. So obviously she didn't use those <laughs> to write about the missing verses. Yeah. Uh, Wilkinson, in our authorized Bible Vindicated, writes the following. We will gain control of instructions in law, talking about the Jesuits, or what their statements are. These are quotes of their statements, and that's why I put this little mischievous creature, this demonic little thing over here that is tearing the scriptures of the Protestants apart in the picture again. We will gain control of instruction in law, medicine, science, education, and so weed out from all books of instruction anything injurious to Roman Catholicism. Martin, you cannot trust a modern encyclopedia. Uh -huh. They are lying to you. What about the medical world? Whoa, Martin, let's not go there. <laughs> because they are the ones that introduced many of the forms of modern medicine. But let's leave that there before we get into trouble. We will mold the thoughts and the ideas of the youth. We will enroll ourselves as Protestant preachers and college professors. West Cotton Hort, perhaps? Uh -huh. Tischendorf, perhaps? What about God and Newman? Yes. In the different Protestant faiths, sooner or later, we will undermine the authority of the Greek New Testament of Erasmus. That's the one that the Protestant Bibles, the New Testament, is based on. Mm and also of those Old Testament productions which have dared to raise their head against the Old Testament of the Vulgate and against tradition. Mm. 
and thus will we undermine the Protestant Reformation. This is what they said. Now, Martin, Old Testament manuscripts. The Old Testament was based on the Masoretic text. Yes. Now, Oregon mm -hmm. wrote a comparison of different Old Testament writings, and he had one Greek manuscript, which is called the Septuagint, the Alex X, mm -hmm. uh, translated apparently by 70 individuals. And Oregon says that uh, scholars were invited from Jerusalem and they sent representatives from every tribe mm. to translate it. Firstly, that is illegal because only the Levites were to mm -hmm. be involved in transcribing manuscripts. Yeah, yeah. And in any case, the northern tribes didn't exist at that stage anymore, so it's obviously yeah, a lie. For a long time already. Yes. But one of these columns in his comparative Old Testament writings is the Septuagint. They say they will undermine the Protestant Bible that uses for the Old Testament the Masoretic text. Mm. Now, they prefer the Septuagint, and they tell you that Christ used it. Now, there's no evidence of the Septuagint other than in the writings of Oregon, Oregon from the second century. Who was a Gnostic. Who was a Gnostic. And if you take that one at its word, then, Martin, we can conclude that Methuselah was a very strong swimmer. <laughs> Correct. Because he survived the flood by some 14 years. And the only way, if we want to believe that, is that he must have been swimming for 14 years to survive the flood because he wasn't in the ark. <laughs> so, Martin, there are discrepancies in the timeline. For example, if you want to take the original text, the Masoretic text, and you want to study the timelines, you will get to about 6,000 years for the age of the earth. True. Whereas if you take the Septuagint, you are very fluid and you could end with anything up to 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. So the timelines are all messed up. Wouldn't the Jesuits love something like that? Of course. We listened to Dawkins. What did he say about the 6,000 years? Yes. Now, Martin, if the Septuagint was used in the time of Christ, there's no evidence for that yep. other than their statements. So uh, is it really true well, or not? If I'm not mistaken, even if you take the text that they say he quoted, it's not even in the, quote, uh, the Septuagint. It's actually in the Masoretic text. But the fact of the matter is, there's no evidence that it existed in yeah. that time other than that it is in Oregon's writings. So they call it the missing link because it doesn't exist. It sounds like uh, evolution. Yes. So <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe that Methuselah was that strong a swimmer. So I prefer to believe the version that is in the Protestant Bible. Amen. And the Jesuits can play as much as they like. That version is available. And it's not copyrighted, Martin. It cannot be. It cannot, because you cannot copyright God's word. Yeah. All right, Martin, so let's have a look at some interesting statements. Let's talk about the authority of the Holy Spirit being replaced with the authority of man. Cardinal Hosius, who was the president of the Great Council of Trent, affirmed that apart from the authority of the church, the scripture would have no more weight than the fables of Aesop. Sure. That's quite a statement, Martin. He says the Bible is like the fables of Aesop if it weren't for the church. They will tell you what's right in it and what's wrong in it. That's arrogance. That's the same we saw that in the previous the, um, episode. It fits right in with the Antichrist. Yes, and you know what they use the Bible to support that? In fact, they support their position by invoking 2 Peter 1 verse 20, but they totally ignore verse 21. Mm. Because verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Mm. So they say they interpret it for you. Yeah. But verse 21 says, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the prophetic interpretation is the onus of God That's who it. will enlighten you with his spirit. So the Holy Ghost is the one that does it and not the church. Not the church. In 1481 AD, the Vatican manuscript was discovered in the Vatican Library. This is a corrupted manuscript which repeatedly casts aside the deity of Christ. It reflects the Arianism of Oregon and is thought by some to be one of the surviving manuscripts done by Eusebius at the command of Constantine. The date of its writing coincides with the ecumenical Bible of Constantine. This comes from Les Garrett, which Bible can we trust? Well, this is what many scholars believe. The Synecdoche manuscript, which was discovered in 1844 at Mount Sinai in the monastery of St. Catherine, agrees closely with the Vatican manuscript and minimizes the deity of Christ and is also Arian in nature. It is safe to suggest that these two manuscripts were two of the 50 that were written for Constantine, even though some people say that they are modern forgeries. Mm. So either way, they are full of errors, corrected over and over again, but this is the ocean of purity that the modern ones are based on. And the 1881 text of Westcott and Hawked This text departed from the Textus Receptus and follows the Vatican and Sinaiticus corruptions. Most scholars from every spectrum of Christianity have knowingly or otherwise promoted the Westcott and Hawk from that time to the present. So these scholars, Martin, if you go to the Bible translation committees, they all have Jesuits on them. Yeah. And they all admit that they are eclectic texts and that they are dynamic equivalent and that we can expect the changes to come as they discover more corruptions and introduce them. Yeah. And they are higher critical texts. Mm. So, Martin, is this the word of God or is this something else? No, it's, it's definitely something else. As Garrett writes, who but those with Roman Catholic sympathies could ever be pleased with the notion that God preserved the true New Testament text in secret for almost 1,000 years and then finally handed it over to the Roman pontiff for safekeeping? That's a very good question. Isn't that a good question? <laughs> for sure. Makes no sense whatsoever. And God gave the Reformation spurious documents to base their theology on, and we <laughs> really have to go back to Catholicism and believe that you can roast in purgatory and beg the Pope for an indulgence to shorten that time. So, Westcott and Hort, these two gentlemen, were they true Protestants or were they Jesuit infiltrators? If you read their own writings, I think they were definitely Jesuit. They were Catholic through and through. Mariology, higher criticism, their job was to denigrate the scriptures, to drag them through the mud. Mm. They were evolutionists. They didn't believe the word of God, but they claimed that the Vaticanus mm. and the Sinaiticus were oceans of purity. They were oceans of mud, yeah, for sure. as far as I was concerned. They were spiritists. So they were in communication with demons. Yes, often. they even describe how they were were frightened when the thing started rattling and moving around in one of their spiritualistic meetings. They were in communion with demons, mm -hmm. these people. So let's wrap this up. We read in, the, in Bible Echo of 1897, man can be exalted only by laying hold of the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. The finest intellect The most exalted position will not secure heaven. Martin, you cannot bypass repentance and accepting the righteousness of Christ. You cannot bypass obedience to God's requirements. You cannot replace repentance with penance no. and then do the same thing over and over again. Satan had the highest education that could be obtained. This education he received under the greatest of all teachers. That was when he was in heaven. 
When men talk of higher criticism, when they pass their judgments upon the word of God, call their attention to the fact that they have forgotten who was the first and wisest critic. Namely the devil, mm, right? Mm. He has had thousands of years of practical experience. He it is who teaches the so-called higher critics of the world today. God will punish all those who, as higher critics, exalt themselves and criticize God's holy word. Powerful statement. Maybe it's a good warning that I think people must take note of. Letters and manuscripts. It is the mind and character of the persons who study the scriptures that makes the study dangerous. Mm. The difficulties will be removed from the way of those who search the scripture with earnest, humble hearts, praying to the Lord for wisdom, not asking the church to clarify it for you. No. There's to be no cutting out of scriptures, no, no removing 60,000 words, mm. no removing whole texts and mutilating others, no mutilating the word as Catholics have done. Oh. So who's behind it? What's behind it? Who's involved? The Bible is to be searched as a whole. The thing in it hard to be understood will become plain through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. This is the way to study the scriptures. Now modern people say, the King James is too hard to read with all this thee, thou, mm. thine, etc., etc. Now, even in the time of King James. That was not the common language anymore. No. Everything was you. Yeah. But they decided to leave it there for the sake of clarity. That's the it. Bible is also a covenant. It's a legal document. That's the second portion. And as a legal document, it has to have legal writing. It has to be very specific as to who is being addressed. Mm -hmm. Now, when there is a T involved, like in thee, thine, thou then it is addressing the individual. Mm. When there is a Y involved, like in ye and your and you, it is addressing it in the plural. Mm. The only the case difference, whether it's nominative, accusative, or dative, the case differs. But it's very specific. Let me give you an example. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He says, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Who is he addressing? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. T, thee, the person itself, singular. Ye mm -hmm. must be born again. Not thou must be no. born again. Ye, yeah. that means everybody Everyone. must be born again. So it's very precise. And once you get used to it, you can almost not read the modern ones because you don't know who it is referring to in particular. So if you do that same sentence in the normal talk today. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. It's gone. So the Bible has to be searched as a whole. The thing in it hard to be understood will become plain through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. So you have to approach your Bible prayerfully. Mm. And once you get used to a received text Bible, now I'm not a King James only man, but the King James is based on the received text, purified seven, seven times. times. The Luther Bible is based on the received text. The Schlachter Bible in German is based on the received text. The old Afrikaans version, like the 3353 version, that is based on the received text. It's the modern ones mm. that have the verses missing and have angels mutilating humanity and all such nonsense in them. So we must decide, what do we want to read? So let's leave that decision to everyone. But as for me and my house, for sure. if I want to know what did God say and not did what did the theologian think he said, and if I want to read every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, then I will grab a Bible that comes out of the stable of Protestants where Christ is exalted as the Savior of the world, the Redeemer who will clothe us with his righteousness. Nice. 
I am with you. My house is also standing on that side. So let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you that we have a pure, purified seven times Bible at our disposal. Help us to make use of it, to understand the times we are living in, to understand the prophecies, to understand the plan of salvation, that we do not get trapped into spurious doctrines like purgatory, etc., but that we understand that our salvation lies in the only one who has the power to save, because he has life within himself, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.